All right, I think we will get started here so that we can sort of stay in time with uh, this session. Hello and uh, welcome everyone to this joint skill sharing session on the guidebook for monitoring and evaluating ecosystem-based adaptation. My name is Luise Richter and I'm working for the BMU ICI funded global project on mainstreaming EBA, which is implemented by GIZ. I will be your facilitator for this session, but um, as I just mentioned, this is a joint session that we're doing um, done by GIZ, the UN Environment Program World Conservation and Monitoring Center and the Friends of EBA Network. It's great to have you here and we look forward to this upcoming hour and having interesting inputs and lively discussions with you in this time. Before we dive into the topic, I would like to make some technical remarks. Um, so first of all, the session will be recorded and published on the CBA event webpage afterwards. So for those of you who would not like to be recorded, I would kindly ask you to leave the session now. It will be available for you to watch afterwards. I would also kindly ask all of you to mute yourselves and turn your videos off during the inputs, except of course, if you're a speaker or a presenter. However, this does not mean that you cannot actively contribute to the session. Um, we have a chat box and um, you can always post your questions and comments in there. We will get back to these after the input. Um, and since this is a skill sharing session, we would also really like uh, to hear from you and learn from your experiences. Um, so um, for this, we have prepared two little surveys and we will make room for discussion during the session. And we invite you to participate in both. Um, we will post the links to the surveys. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to your contributions. If you have any technical problems, please just write in the chat and um, we will um, do our best to help you out. With this, um, let's return uh, to what the session is actually about, which is the new guidebook for monitoring and evaluating ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, perfect, the link has just been posted, um, just in case you haven't had a chance to actually look at the guidebook yet. Um, the m guidebook has been published by uh, the, the GIZ implemented global project mainstreaming EBA, but it has been developed in collaboration with UNEPW CMC as part of a FIBA working group on monitoring and evaluation. Um, and today we have Emily Goodwin with us, who's a program officer at IUCN and she's central to the FIBA secretariat. Um, and I would kindly ask Emily to um, maybe briefly tell us about what FIBA is and which role working groups play within FIBA. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Louisa. Um, I'll, I'll stay very quick, being conscious of time, um, but for those of you who are not familiar, um, FIBA is a global collaborative network of more than 80 different agencies and organizations involved in ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, working jointly to share experiences and knowledge um, to improve the implementation of EBA activities on the ground and through this collaboration to have a stronger and more strategic learning and policy influence on EBA. Um, the term EBA was introduced um, now almost 12 years ago and EBA has really paved the way for the uptake of this idea of working with nature is a cornerstone of adaptation strategies to address climate risks, biodiversity crisis and human well-being altogether. Um, FIBA really works to collaboratively synthesize all of this different stakeholder knowledge on EBA and disseminate this knowledge by convening the global EBA community around different events, workshops, and expert working groups. Um, and the m and &E guidebook was produced in collaboration with an expert working group on monitoring and evaluation, including many different FIBA members. Um, we're proud that such a diversity of FIBA members have worked together with GIZ and um, WCMC on contributing to this guidebook. And we look forward to continuing this work with the FIBA network to mainstream, mainstream the guidance in the guidebook to support the development of effective monitoring and evaluation across our members' EBA projects around the world. Um, at this big global level, this approach to consistently evaluating EBA measures allows us to better scale up with concrete and tangible evidence, the value addition of working with nature for climate adaptation around the world. Um, so now to get us started, we have a couple of quick 
questions um, via Mintimeter, um, which you all may be familiar with. So let me just share the link quickly in the chat. So if everyone could um, use that link to get to Mintimeter, or there's also a code if you go on your phones to www.minty.com and type in that code, it's two different options to get there. And I see that people, I'm just going to share my screen so we can see the results sort of in live stream. If anyone is having trouble accessing Minty, just let us know and we can help you out. So I'll just leave it open for just a couple seconds. We just wanted to get the chance to know who is joining us today on this call. Looks like some people are still up very late over in Asia. <laughs> yeah, I think the CBA conference had a lot of early risers and people <laughs> staying late as well. I'm just gonna click through to the next question. Um, just so we can get a feel of the room, um, how would you rank your experience in designing, monitoring, and evaluation? Have you done this in projects that you've worked on? Do you know much about this as we sort of dive into the work of the guidebook? There are no wrong answers. Everyone is, we're excited to have everyone here. All right, so it looks like a lot of people in the room are ranking themselves as having a little bit of experience doing this. Um, so it will be great to sort of take those experiences that you've had and um, apply them to the guidebook and see where the guidebook can um, help the work that is ongoing. And then as a last question, um, I'm just curious, well, now it looks like, <laughs> um, it looks like this question has not worked out perfectly in Mintimeter, so maybe we'll leave it for now. We were just curious the sort of um, if people have been engaged in EBA projects specifically before, if their monitoring and evaluation measures were applied to other different CBA projects. Um, but this is uh, I will I will skip this question for now because it looks like something has not gone through all the way. <laughs> oh, Sorry about that. I'll hand it back over to Louisa. <laughs> Or you can mention that option one is yes, option two is no, and we can just click after you mention. Yeah, that is true. That is a good way to do it. So let's Very say good that idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and two is no. And three is nothing. <laughs> can you repeat the options, Emily, and maybe share your screen again? No. So apologies for this, but we'll say option one is yes. You're familiar with EBA. You've worked on EBA projects before. Or two is no, this is totally new to you. Can you share the Can screen share again? So that we can see the results. See, and I was I was watching the um, interesting results and keeping it from you guys. So it looks like we um, uh, have a, a pretty interesting distribution, actually. It seems like a lot of you have worked on EBA, but it's also new to some of some of us in the room. So I will hand it back over to Louisa and we will dive into the guidebook from here. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Emily. So um, yeah, let's now move on um, and have a look at the agenda. Um, because yeah, we have um, some inputs prepared for you um, in a first step. Um, Sylvia, um, Sylvia Vikanda from UNEP WCMC will give us an overview of the guidebook um, and um, yeah, share how it's structured and what you can find in there. Um, and afterwards, I will dive into um, the development of indicators um, in um, an EBA project in Vietnam where we also used a theory of change. 
Um, and after that, we have another survey. And um, yeah, this uh, this is a skill sharing session, so we really want to hear from you as well. Um, so um, we hope that from from the survey, we can have an interesting discussion with you. Um, and of course, we also want to answer your questions. So with this, um, I would like to hand over to Sylvia. Um, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Louisa. Let's just get the presentation back up. Um, right, I hope you can all see that now. <laughs> yep. Great. Yes, yeah, so as, as Louisa has already introduced, um, this Skillshare is uh, about ME, EBA, and also to give you an overview of the guidebook. So um, these were the, the partners involved in publishing, collaborating, and producing the guidebook, as Louisa has mentioned. And the goal for right now is um, for me to just give you a brief overview of the guidebook to get you acquainted with its contents and hopefully to entice you to take a, a closer look. And I think we've posted the link in the chat so feel free to browse. But before I get into the guidebook, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit about the rationale as to why we even bothered uh, developing a guidebook for monitoring and um, evaluating EBA. So as I'm sure this audience is very well aware, we're at a point where we absolutely have no option but to adapt to negative climate change impacts. And EBA is an important approach for doing so. Um, but unfortunately, there are quite a few uncertainties involved in EBA um, due to its social ecological complexities and interlinkages. Um, but fear not, because there are ways of dealing with uncertainty, um, including using m and &E, because monitoring and evaluation provides basically the foundation for adaptive management which means it's key to managing uncertainties, um, including those involved in EBA. And so we need m and &E for understanding whether or not, as well as why an intervention is achieving its objectives. And m and &E for adaptation more broadly speaking is quite tricky and it's even more the case for EBA. Um, as I already mentioned, it's, you know, the, operating in a social ecological system. And um, meaningful m and &E, as in something that will actually tell you about results and outcomes of EBA, therefore often gets neglected because it's not entirely straightforward. So that's why, in, in short, we um, developed the, the guidebook, which is, is here to help address some of those problems. And um, we had received a lot via different channels um, of, of requests for support in this area because it is both um, critical to implementing safe and effective EBA as well as it being challenging. So what does the guidebook do? Um, well, it provides an overview of the process for designing and implementing effective m and &E for EBA interventions on the ground. Um, so it kind of goes through intricacies and challenges associated with monitoring and evaluating EPA, and it really places emphasis on evaluating outcomes and ideally impact, um, rather than you know what often happens in projects, which is looking at inputs and processes in a monitoring system. And the guidebook is primarily aimed at practitioners and planners who design and implement e um, EBA on the ground. Um, it can obviously be used by others, including in research. Um, and generally, it will help those who want to assess and understand results of EBA interventions. And we recommend using this guidebook, ideally in the early stages of designing an EBA intervention, but it can certainly also be of uh, use once a project or an intervention is already underway. Um, for example, to improve the original uh, logical framework that was developed or any ongoing m and &E processes. And um, the guidebook can also help um, design a midterm review 
um, as well as a terminal evaluation of a project, for example. And it starts, so the guidebooks is, is structured as follows. It starts, you know, with a background section that introduces key terms and concepts for understanding both ecosystem-based adaptation and monitoring and evaluation um, so that it can kind of be accessible to people who have, you know, varying degrees of experience in both of these areas. Um, and it goes into a bit of detail on the complexities and challenges associated with m and &E for EBA, as well as adaptation more broadly, um, because understanding these complexities is indeed key to being able to address them or at least manage them. And then it has, is basically structured around um, these four steps, which I'll go into more detail um, on in a minute. And each section also includes um, a little summary at the start so that you can quickly see what the section is about and you can navigate through the, the guidebook. Um, you know, we're trying to, we've tried to make this uh, user friendly. Um, every section also has an additional useful resources um, section, which often will include complementary um, information sources such as detailed guidance on um, developing certain methodologies, um, basically more, more detailed resources um, than what is outlined in the, the, this m and &E guidebook itself. Um, we've also included a lot of case study boxes in the guidebook to give you an idea of some of the kind of best practice components in practice from around the world. And there are also annexes um, that have a variety of practical um, examples and other information to help you um, implement the content of the guidebook. And um, so taking a slightly closer look at the four steps, um, and while I go into them, don't forget or please keep in mind that there is no one size fits all approach for monitoring and evaluating EBA. Um, it is, as you'll probably all be aware, very context specific. But these four steps are broad ones that any project team um, of an EBA intervention can follow. Um, so they, they will not go into the detail of what you do need to do when you are operating in a mangrove ecosystem, for example. Um, but the, the steps will be, you know, are written in a way so that they can be picked up by someone working in coastal zones and dry lands um, or wherever you're, you're operating, basically. Um, so project teams can use these as a basis for designing um, and implement, implementing robust m and &E systems anywhere. And step one is all about developing a results framework. So it discusses the need for setting clear objectives and mapping the pathway for achieving these objectives. Um, it explains how results frameworks can assist you in doing so, and it tells you a little bit about the different types of results frameworks, but it does recommend using a theory of change approach, um, which is one type of results framework um, that is basically uh, more and more recognized in the wider adaptation community as well as being the kind of um, most suitable results framework for adaptation projects, including EBA, because they're long-term and complex. Um, so then the guidebook expands, uh, or step one expands on when and broadly how to use this theory of change approach, um, some potential limitations to keep in mind, also what it can look like. And step two then goes into defining indicators, baselines, and targets. And um, so it introduces different types of indicators available for m and &E and highlights the importance of focusing on outcomes and impact and outcome and impact indicators, um, in addition to your typical, you know, process and input um, indicators, um, because the former will really allow you to understand effectiveness. And um, it provides some general guidance uh, for selecting indicators. Indicators will be highly context specific, so um, it, you know there there's no long there's no sort of go to list for indicators. Um, but but the guidebook does tell you how you can go about selecting, identifying, or developing them yourself. And it highlights the importance of setting a baseline and identifying targets um, so that you can actually measure the indicators. 
And so step three really goes into operationalizing the ME system. So how can you put everything that you've been planning in steps one and two into practice? Um, and some of those elements are choosing the right evaluation design, um, important considerations about data types and elements um, of effective and efficient data collection, entry, analysis, and interpretation, because those are all key to actually understanding what um, you are collecting in your ME system. And then step four, goes into using and communicating the results. So we don't want to um, have a you know, situation where you've collected a lot of data and you don't do anything with it. Um, so it discusses the need to use m and &E results both for, let's call it an internal process. So we're using it to inform adaptive management. How can you improve the, the intervention that's being um, implemented as well as communicating to external audiences and you know, why, why it's important to do so for different audiences like donors, communities, policymakers, researchers, or um, people in the wider adaptation community. And so that's just a whistle-stop tour um, of what you'll find in the, the guidebook, which, like I said, I think it's um, in the link, or you can also go to adaptationcommunity.net under resources and find it, as well as lots of other useful um, tools and methods. And so that's, that's all for me for now, but thanks for your attention. And um, I will stop sharing and hand over to Louisa, who will tell you a little bit more about a, an example from Vietnam. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. All right, let me share my screen. Can you give me a quick sign if this is working? Yes. Perfect, thanks. Yes, so I will talk a little bit about um, the development of indicators um, for a monitoring and evaluation system um, in a, a project in Vietnam. Um, that I worked in. Um, and um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, this was a project called Strategic Mainstreaming of Ecosystem-Based Adaptation in Vietnam. Um, you can also find more information about the project overall on the Panorama platform. Um, we've included a link in this presentation as well, where um, multiple examples from um, this uh, project are included. Um, it, it was a project that was implemented um, between 2014 and 2019 um, on behalf of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment um, in Vietnam and um, the German BMU and its International Climate Initiative. Um, and um, yeah, it was um, then more on an implementation level um, implemented by the Institute of Strategy and Policy on Natural Resources and Environment and GIZ. So funding um, from um, Monterey and um, BMU and then implemented by ICE Monterey and GIZ. Um, the project supported the development of effective EBA approaches in Vietnam um, through, for instance, the integration of EBA into national policy frameworks through different awareness raising activities um, that were both done um, for stakeholders at national and provincial levels. Um, but then we also um, did um, uh, capacity development activities um, really for local communities because we had two project sites, which you can see here um, in uh, the little map that I included. Um, and um, in these um, pilot areas, we had concrete um, EBA measures that we were Im implementing um, from forest enrichment, um, also including livelihood um, activities um, over capacity building. Um, and um, yeah, um, so M&E was really um, a main focus of this project and developing an M&E system and in particular indicators um, for the project. 
So um, when we uh, got started on um, developing uh, indicators, um, we um, based a lot of um, our um, sort of way to go um, on recommendations that were given in a concept note that had been written um, for the project. And in this concept note, um, there was a lot of connection to the GIZ guidebook adaptation made to measure. Um, this guidebook suggests um, developing um, and an m and &E system based on five steps, as you can see here um, on the right side. And um, what we noticed um, after looking at this for a while and um, doing all sorts of research um, and looking into how we'd actually go about it was that um, if you have good baseline data, which is core um, to um, developing a good M&E system, but if you have that in place from the beginning of your project, um, it's sufficient to focus on the steps three to five, which are developing a results framework, defining indicators and setting a baseline, and then operationalizing the, um, the monitoring system that you have developed. So this is sort of what we focused on because we had our baseline in place. Um, so um, instead of um, developing a results framework as, um, as described here, we decided to go for a theory of change model um, because um, of the research that we'd been doing um, and some of the experiences that uh, some of my colleagues had. And um, we also decided to then um, use another five-step mechanism um, for actually um, identifying indicators, um, which uh, I think is really helpful for actually breaking it down and developing indicators step by step. So um, what we did, this is just um, a rough overview of um, a draft theory of change that we had um, was, um, yeah, we made a rather simple theory of change, um, which was developed in close co collaboration um, with um, both my, uh, my colleagues um, who worked in the provinces and who worked with uh, the communities in the pilot sites a lot and um, a lot of uh, talks and discussions that we had um, during field visits, um, which stretched out over uh, roughly two weeks to actually discuss how and what um, we should, um, should measure um, things. Um, and we had set up an overall um, objective um, for uh, our theory of change, which you can see in orange at the top. Um, so this is um, just the draft for one of the pilot sites. We did this for, um, for both uh, pilot sites. And um, yeah, we had this, this overall objective for the theory of change based on the objectives of the project. Um, and what we did then was we went down um, to the activity level and actually looked at what, what, what has been done, what are we doing in the project at the moment. And from this, we worked our way up. Um, so from identifying activities, um, we uh, developed uh, outputs and then outcomes and results and impacts. And as you can see, we always tried to see where all these different steps were interlinked. And um, what was really important for us and also extremely helpful um, for me, a big learning experience was to include assumptions in this process because it really showed us how and where things might go different from what we are currently expecting them to be and how and why we might need to change. So I think it gives you, you know, it really is sort of the heart of a theory of change, showing you how and why um, things might go different and that you will need to stay flexible with, with your theory of change, um, which I think is a great advantage of, of this model. Um, overall, um, the theory of change for me was very helpful to understand where we were coming from and where we wanted to go in this process. Um, and as I said, also to see how and why we might need to do things differently. But then it was particularly helpful for um, identifying indicators because um, what we did with this was uh, we essentially had um, for all the different levels. So for an output and outcome, um, a result um, level, we, for all these levels, we developed indicators um, and we already essentially had our themes for these ready. Um, I will actually get back to this slide in a moment, but um, so what we did for the identification of indicators was then to apply um, these five steps that um, I already mentioned before, which were defining a subject, 
And again, I'm just gonna go back for this one. Defining a subject was essentially what you can see in this slide. Um, so defining a subject meant going into the output level and looking at one of these boxes and saying, okay, this is our subject. And now from this, having a subject, we can actually move on and um, develop an indicator for the specific subject. We did that for all the different boxes on all the different levels. And we always did that checking in, or I always did that checking in with um, and developing it together with my colleagues um, in Vietnam, in the provinces, and also um, being in close contact with um, the communities. So um, when you have your subjects defined for all these different um, levels um, and sort of timeframes that are connected to them, um, we then moved on to specifying quantity, um, quantity of change and quality of change. We then defined a time horizon. Um, and um, then if you have any sort of specific disaggregation, um, that you want to use. It might be gender. Um, it could be something else as well. Um, you can add that to it as well. And then you essentially combine all these five, five steps into one. Um, so this is um, just an example of an outcome indicator. So um, as you can see up here also with a rather short time frame. So for example, what you can have out of this is over two years, 50% of the households in Hua Bing village and 30% of the population in the additionally selected communities in Quang Bing province, particularly women, youth union um, and farmer association members have gained knowledge and experience on climate change, have seen its implications in practice and are sharing their knowledge with others. So this is of course, um, it's very extensive, um, but at the same time, it includes a lot of different factors that you do want to have in an indicator. Um, so, you know, sort of breaking it down into different steps and then combining it into one was really helpful um, for us to actually understand what we needed in an indicator. And um, as mentioned, um, we repeated this procedure for all the different themes, um, which were linked to raising uh, awareness raising activities, training, income generating activities, pl plantation activities, and so on. Um, and for um, the different timeframes um, that we had um, developed here. So output, outcome, and impact level. So um, some things about this worked out well and others were definitely more challenging. I'm gonna start with uh, what worked well from, from our perspective. So um, we developed this in a very participatory way, which um, I think was really core for sort of setting the indicators right. Um, so actually, you know, going um, to um, the provinces and being in the communities, um, we did all the talks, of course, in Vietnamese, and then my colleagues translated, which wasn't always easy, but it was also at the same time very nice to have this this opportunity to actually um, hear what people thought would be necessary um, to measure over a longer period of time. Um, so this was core. Um, then also the partner staff and the communities received training um, in how to operationalize the M&E system. Um, and as many of you will probably know, um, when talking about EBA, we need to look at environmental, economic, and social aspects at the same time. So um, including all, all these different categories in our development of indicators and actually coming up with indicators for these different aspects um, was also, also really important. And um, I think is core for, um, for making a good indicator system when you wanna do M&E for EBA. Then as mentioned before, using a theory of change was um, very helpful because it was very hands-on. And I think for, for all of us who were um, in the developing team, it also actually made us understand processes much better ourselves. Um, and then also using this five-step model for developing indicators. So breaking it down into five smaller steps um, and then sort of, sort of putting it back together worked very well. Then of course, some things were more challenging. Um, this was, for instance, um, actually measuring um, knowledge and capacity. Um, as you saw in the one indicator I also read out, um, EBA is often um, linked to sort of changes in people's awareness and um, understanding um, 
of um, of a situation of climate change overall. And measuring this is only possible to a limited degree. In the end, you will often talk to people. You will um, focus more on qualitative indicators, which is good. You should always have a combination of qualitative and quantitative indicators. But still, it sometimes um, becomes difficult to actually say, how do we measure this? And you could also see that in um, the indicator I read out. There was a certain vagueness to it, um, because in the end, what you can do is you can ask people um, if they feel like they have a better understanding of something. Um, so this was definitely um, a challenge that we faced. Then um, the classical, classical one, timeframes for measuring EBA um, in the, or, or for, for, for EBA indicators overall and for EBA activities. Um, many EBA activities only become effective after many years um, and they go past project cycles, which is also definitely the case with this project, which, as I said earlier, ended officially in 2019. Um, and of course, it does become difficult to also follow up on um, how the M&E system continues to be used. We tried um, to um, make sure that the system is actually being used and understood um, by the people um, who live and work in the area. Um, so what we did was we um, passed the task on to the provincial departments and developed a manual for the implementation and usage of the M&E tables. And um, we did um, training both on the ground in the communities and um, for the partners. Um, however, um, it is hard to follow up on this. Um, I have um, a little bit of, of, of an update on how the system has been used, but it does stay a little vague and it's hard to follow up on, on how it's being used right now. And I'm sure it's also hard to actually make sure that it keeps going. Then language and terminology was also a challenge. So um, what can happen is that you define indicators and then the people who go and try to measure them um, have another understanding of or idea of what should be measured um, um, in comparison to what the other side then understands when you, know, you have um, an interview or a discussion then understands what, what, what should be measured. So making sure that everyone understands and is on the same page of, hey, we wanna look at this um, how has this evolved is difficult and was a problem also in this case when people went back um, later on um, to actually make sure that everyone really still understood and knew um, what exactly are we trying to look at. So being very clear in your terminology and also having um, everyone um, involved being um, able to actually explain it well um, is important. So um, just a brief um, insight uh, in terms of what has um, happened uh, since. Um, I, as I already mentioned, um, it's not easy to um, get a follow-up on this, um, but since project implementation started in 2016, there have been some results um, to certain um, process and outcome indicators. Um, however, sort of the long-term monitoring um, that is not in place yet, but that's also sort of like, it lies in the nature of the thing that, um, yeah, the, the monitoring hasn't been going on for long enough. So um, I know um, from talking to my colleagues in Vietnam that forest enrichment measures have um, started to uh, contribute to higher forest density and also to a richer composition of forests and that the forests are better maintained so that um, they are healthier and can provide um, better services, uh, goods and services to people. Um, and they have also shared with me that capacity building measures have led to um, yeah, people being able to also share their knowledge with um, other farmers in the area. Um, I also know that, um, for instance, the coastal forest enrichment that we've um, been focusing on in one of the provinces have actually led to an increased forest density, um, which in turn has resulted in um, sort of better services um, for um, the reduction of uh, drifting sand. Um, so these are just some of the insights that I could get from, from my colleagues, but as you see, I don't really have numbers on this. Um, so, um, yeah, sort of making M&D long term and keeping on following up on how it's being implemented is um, a challenge. This is where I would like to end with um, my presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. 
And um, with this, um, we would actually like to move on to um, another um, little survey that we have prepared. Um, because um, as I already mentioned a few times, we would like all of you um, to actively participate and share your examples um, and your knowledge on M&E at this point. And we hope to kick off a good discussion with you um, through this, uh, these, uh, these little questions that we have prepared. Um, and it would also be great if afterwards you're happy to share something, if you just unmute yourself um, and um, share it um, sort of with your own voice with us. Um, if you have questions um, or comments on the presentation, um, please post those in the chat and then we'll get back to those along the way. So I will hand over to Emily again. I don't know, Emily, are you talking? I can't hear you. Just trying to make make sure I was unmuted there. But yes, perfect. So the, it is actually the same link that's already in the chat um, to the same um, Mentimeter link, if everyone can join us there. Um, and the first, we just have sort of two questions in the second part. And the questions are one, um, I mean, with these two presentations, which of these guidebook components um, do you find in your work to be the most challenging process in designing and implementing monitoring and evaluation? And I think even I can, I mean, and, and Sylvia and Louisa, please chime in as these are following up, but I think this is something we've seen pretty consistently in presentations of the guidebook and in sort of feedback on the guidebook, that this question of defining indicators, baselines and targets seems to be a challenge sort of across the board for EBA. Yeah, it, it seems to um, come out on, on top <laughs> in, in the ranking of what is the most challenging um, with when speaking with different audiences. Should we put our questions directly in the chat or um, go ahead on the unmute option? Um, if you have questions about the presentations, um, go ahead and pop them in the chat and we will get back to them after this little bit. Um, but then for sort of our open discussion, um, we thought um, you can just, you know, raise your hand and unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Well, I'll just go to the, sort of the, the final slide then that we have here which is a more open-ended question that if, or do you have examples of implementing monitoring and evaluation that you want to share? Um, anything you put in will be, whether that be a success or a failure, um, anything you put in will be anonymous um, and show up on the screen here and we can sort of start a conversation with these examples, um, with these examples presented, whether that was a project you directly worked on or you know about or success or failure, just to sort of get the conversation going. And then maybe Sylvia, maybe we can, Sylvia and Louisa, maybe we can start answering questions while this is up and people are maybe submitting answers. Sure. Sounds yeah, good. definitely. Um, so I see here that um, we have a couple of questions from Mujaba Ali. And um, so one is about if this, so if the EBA ME guidebook can be used um, in projects that all only have a small environmental focus, or does it require an exclusively environmentally focused project? Um, so across, I would say across all projects, um, there are obviously certain ME. Um, components that they they stay the same across all projects so you can use this guidebook um, for for other uh, non ecosystem based adaptation projects um, and they those ones will also so the non EBA projects will um, still basically benefit from the the steps that are outlined um, in this guidebook 
um, what this guidebook does, of course, is that it focuses on, on ecosystem-based adaptation. So it um, draws attention to issues that you need to consider in um, an EBA project that will link to, you know, the, the fact that there are a lot of ecological components and social components involved um, that interact uh, over um, often even longer time frames than in other adaptation projects, um, especially those, um, you know, using built infrastructure. Um, so in short, you can use this, this guidebook um, will, you can use it for projects that have only a small environmental component. Um, I'm also seeing that you are asking about the difference between the two guidebooks. Um, so the EBA m and &E guidebook and the one Louisa mentioned, which is a more general um, adaptation guidebook, I believe is what you are referring to, yeah. um, which was developed by GIZ some years back. And again, the difference is, you know, EBA has its own set of, um, own set of peculiarities, let's say, and characteristics due to its nature of, you know, working with ecosystems and people. Um, so working with nature to help people adapt to climate change. And um, there are a lot of additional considerations you have to take into account. Um, it, EBA, um, monitoring and evaluating EBA has its own set of um, challenges. And so the, uh, monitor, the this guidebook that we've introduced here um, is specifically focused on EBA projects and will give you all of those additional um, components that you need to be thinking about, which would not um, be mentioned in the previously developed um, GIZ guidebook that is more generally focused on climate change adaptation. So it's, it, it, it'll, the, the previous one has a much broader focus um, than the EBA um, guidebook. Yeah, and maybe quickly adding to yeah. that, Sylvia, um, I think this was also definitely what we experienced. Like if we'd had an, an EBA m and &E guidebook, that would have been super useful at that point because we ran into quite a few of the challenges that are mentioned in the guidebook. Um, and um, yeah, I think for us, it would have been very useful because we, you know, as Sylvia mentioned, the um, the adaptation made to measure is, is, is more generally on adaptation and yeah. Um, we sort of had to specify, like speci specify it from there for our own own purposes. Yeah. Um, I've also seen the question: um, Was the post project monitoring uh, budget built in, and for how long? Um, so. Yes, it was, um, but not for too long. So what we did um, was um, the sort of the GIZ um, involvement in the project um, ended around a year or a year and a half um, before um, the project officially ended. So this phase was actually used to hand everything over to the partners. And um, this was not only for the M&E system, but um, also for um, for the other part. So um, there was a lot of like handing over um, and um, yeah, making sure that M&E um, would continue. So we had a little bit of, of um, a budget planned in um, for for instance, the training phase, um, and for then also always checking, still checking in here and there and hearing um, how things were going. Um, but this was very, very much for a limited period of time, so maximum a year and a half. So definitely not long enough for what you would need for M&E. Um, Great, I see uh, our, our first entry or our first, uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> first response to the question. Um, that's great, thanks very much for uh, sharing the the link to that that's super um if anyone else has has anything similar um you know feel free to pop it in on on mentimeter um equally if you just want to tell us a bit about your experience of um working on m and &E for eba uh you can also unmute yourself um because we are we are trying to have a discussion, I realize it's a little bit um, less organic than sort of when you're together in person, but um, 
do feel free to yeah share share examples and or challenges and of course um solutions if you have you know um overcome any anything in particular um so don't be shy um in the meantime we can have oh i see a couple more questions have come in um could you speak to the challenges and best practices for assessing long-term impact, e.g. with regard to attribution of results to a specific project? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, yes, so indeed there are, as is implied in this question, um, many challenges associated with um, assessing long-term impact. Um, one of them being simply a logistical one in the sense of um, projects are often on a short time frame much shorter than it takes um, especially in an eba project for um, results to be visible i mean if you are um, if you are reforesting an area i mean that or naturally regenerating a, a forest um, that can take you know many many years and so you will obviously um, need to factor in that time frame before you can try to understand whether the ecosystem is delivering the adaptation benefits to you know the the beneficiaries in question um, so you know challenges um, include the time frame the 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 costs um, involved in monitoring um, that over the that time frame and um many many more which are all um outlined in the uh guidebook so if you go into the background section of the m e guidebook for eba um there is a a whole section about that so i won't go into it too much here um and so some of those challenges are specific specific to eba and others overlap with other adaptation projects in general and um, it's not always straightforward to overcome those challenges but throughout the guidebook we have also um, included recommendations and suggestions as well as examples of how people have addressed those i.e you know what could be best practice um, for assessing long-term impact so um, one example um, that's included in the guidebook, for example, is um, that in order to assess, uh, to overcome this challenge of the long-term timescale um, and also sort of the capacity needed to understand um, or to carry out um, reliable m and &E, is that IUCN have worked with um, university partners and research centers in um, West African countries. And um, basically the m and &E system has been integrated into their long-term research projects and they were working with different academics to um, link up um, between, you know, more socioeconomically oriented academics and researchers and ecological researchers um, to design a long-term um, m and &E process so if you take a look so that that's just one example another you know relates to um integrating m e processes into local institutions and, and so on and so forth um but we have included um suggestions to that in the guidebook um i can see that someone else just made a little post um in the mentee that it would be useful to be able to view um uh, examples from more projects or indicators targets uh, definitely agreed um, it would be super nice and useful also for us to hear about more more examples because it is it is a challenge that we're facing that um, there there don't seem to be too many um, M&D systems for EBA out there yet um, so the more examples we can collect of this the better it is to to learn from each other so if you do have something um, as Emily said no matter how well, it worked out. I think it's always good to to share and learn, um, and especially in this field, we all need this. So please go ahead and share. 
Um, I'm also seeing some questions related to, um, so there's, uh, related to indicators. So there's a question about, um, you know, examples of ways to standardize indicators so that they can be compared across programs and regions while still preserving the need for context specific metrics. And then a question about does the EBA guidebook include standard indicators to measure the benefits to people to ensure the EBA interventions are effective, but not just business as usual. Um, so the guidebook itself does not include a list of indicators um, because that could be endless. <laughs> um, and But it does point to sources, other sources um, that have indicator lists, for example, um, both in, in sort of a guidebook format or things that are available online. And, and that is key um, in, you know, when you come to looking for indicators. So a lot, EBA brings together um, work from sectors that have been doing work for a long time and have thought about this a lot. So you can look to, you know, look to the biodiversity, the ecology community for um, well-established uh, indicators in, you know, that will tell you something about um, the ecosystem status, health, um, what kinds of uh, services it's providing, you know, look to the develop, development community, to health communities um, that have established indicators, um, you know, about adaptation benefits you're hoping to see um, resulting from the, the measures. Um, so there are lots of lists that already exist on indicators. So in, while they need to be, while indicators obviously need to be context specific and, and work in the community that you're, you're implementing something in, um, you don't always need to st start from scratch. So the guidebook will point you um, in the direction of such lists in the kind of in the um, useful additional resources section and about coming back to the the issue of standardizing so having some standardized indicators um, to be able to aggregate uh, from across you know this kind of site level focus um, so yes I mean if you are working for example on a program um, that has multiple projects within it um, I mean, uh, uh, what would be ideal is to coordinate among the various sites um, and especially if you're working in a, in a region that will likely have, you know, a similar ecosystem type, you can agree with that your, your, the program you're implementing across each site will have, you know, a, a set of, stand, of, of standardized or the same indicator um, while also maybe um, having some more locally specific indicators. So then at least you will have a kind of a subset of indicators that you've used at, let's say your five project sites that will aggregate um, up to a program level. And then you can use the same approach if you have this kind of influence um, at, at, at a program level or multi-program level as well. Um, and of course, key to this is uh, working closely and communicating with um, whoever is involved in that locality, in that province, whatever unit you're operating in, um, or within the or organization um, that is implementing multiple programs to, um, to coordinate. I mean, that, that's all about communication um, among uh, projects, programs, and, and partners. So it is certainly possible to agree on, you know, a kind of a set of indicators that will be used everywhere in addition to locally specific ones. Um, and then there are also ways of using proxy indicators, for example, to then feed into one indicator um, at a higher level, um, which can help you get around sort of the issue of needing context specific indicators um, while also having some idea of what's ha happening at a more aggregated level. Um, so lots of good questions coming in. Yeah. Um, 
there was also someone Eliza, I think, raised her hand. I don't know if you're still here and want to actually share something. Yes, um, I just would like to ask. Uh, we were working right now with uh, ICT project, intercoastal management project. Uh, in one of uh, uh, typhoon affected areas here in the Philippines, and right now, um, actually. Uh, the project is a three-year project uh, integrating different uh, communities uh, together, working together, and um, we are drafting the indicators. Actually, we, we really don't have uh, the indicator yet because we are um, uh, identifying uh, within the communities uh, based on the VCA, or Vulnerability Capacity Assessment, uh, what are the needs of the community? So what would be the timeline for for uh, for us to, to set uh, if we are implementing the program already and to review the indicators as well? Is it, I mean, is it every year or at least for a three-year project, uh, we'll have a midterm review and then check the indicators. We do have to come to an end soon, but I don't know, Sylvia, if you want to give a quick answer to this one. Um, you, you were breaking up a little bit, Eliza, but did I understand that you were trying to get a sense of, of the time it could take to develop indicators using the approach used in Vietnam or just generally speaking? Uh, yeah, it's, it's some kind of that because we are still working with the community in terms of, of uh, drafting the indicators that, that we have, that we will create. Yeah, I, I mean, it would be interesting to hear from Louisa how long it took um, using the five-step yeah. approach because there, there are obviously lots of different approaches to developing indicators. In any case, they should always, always, always link back to the theory of change that is developed if there is a theory of change in place. That's one thing I would say. But um, so that the approaches would certainly vary in terms of time frame. But like, for example, Louisa's um, case that she presented in Vietnam used a very specific participatory process for, you know, using that five-step approach um, for indicator development. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how long that took. Yeah, sure. Um, so over, like we, I think, needed um, something around four, four months probably to develop the system from when we started four to five months um, from when we started um, going out um, and actually talking to the communities. Um, it was a long review process um, between me and my colleagues, always sending things back and forth and discussing how exactly we should go about this. So um, you do need a little bit of time, I think, to also, you know, let that ideas sink in and then rework it a little bit, take it back with you um, and develop it further. Um, plus not everyone um, in your team might be, um, might know like equally well how to work on such a system and develop it. So you also need to make sure that everyone's sort of on board and understands the process well. So planning some time for that is important. I also understood a little bit from your um, question that you are currently um, in the vulnerability um, assessment phase and when you should then start developing indicators. Um, if your vulnerability assessment is essentially your baseline, I think it's good to get that in place. Um, in our project, we had um, a sort of like a baseline drawn at the very, very beginning and then a more extensive vulnerability assessment later on, um, which um, was definitely influencing our M&E system, but it wasn't um, sort of the only source because we had um, the baseline data from before. But if this is sort of your core data, baseline data, I think it's worth waiting for this phase to be done and then starting um, developing the indicators because you do want to have a good baseline to relate things to. Um, 
I think we will come to an end now because we're definitely over time. We've been asked a few times if we can share our presentations. Um, the recording will definitely be shared. I don't know exactly how it works with sharing the presentation, but I think we'd definitely be happy to share that. Um, this is maybe a, a question to the technical team. Um, I don't know if you can quickly come in and give us an information on this. How, how presentations will be shared or if they will be shared? Um, they all will be uploaded um, as possibly within three days um, by the end of the festival, hopefully sooner, uh, but I'm sure you will get an email on how to access everything. Perfect, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, then um, I think we will close at this point to uh, not take up more time. Um, but uh, thank you very much for um, these really interesting questions and discussions. It was um, gre really great to uh, be here with you and um, we wish you um, a nice uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Bye -bye. And I also wanted to add that um you know, feel free to reach out to us at any point um, in relation to this yeah. work. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, um, well, the, the guidebook exists now, um, but we hope to, you know, use it as a source of starting off conversations and getting some good work going in this area. Um, so, yeah, if you have questions, you know, get in touch and especially we're always looking for examples and um, good, good practice cases. So, yeah, feel free to be in touch and um, form a, you know, good community of practice around this. I will quickly post my email address in the chat so that um, you have mine and then maybe uh, Emily and um, Sylvia, you yeah. can do the same. I, yeah, I, I think my e email should be in the, um, the presentation. The, yeah, and the, um, on the website, but um, we've just posted them in the chat box. Uh, in case anyone is interested. Perfect. All right. So, thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Everyone, bye.